Let me know. Kitty, we're good, right? I think we can get started. Yep. Okay, great. Okay. Good evening, everyone. It's 604. I'm personally calling this meeting to order. Welcome to the Ad Hoc Sustainability Resilience Committee. Quick roll call. We have with us council members Shanahan, Dunn, and obviously myself. And Katie, do we have anyone for public participation? Oh, what? yes, we have one hand raised. Okay, great. So as a reminder, three minutes, uh, state your first name, last name, address, and speak directly to an item on the agenda, please. Um, here we go. My name, is Linnell, my name is Linnell Jones, and my address is 10 Point Road. My comment this evening relates to the minutes in your agenda. Regarding my public comment, it is written, her comments were off topic and not on items listed on the agenda. She was given every opportunity to address items on the agenda, but refused. Her participation was cut short by Mr. Lopez. Your agenda included SLR consultants introducing the draft sustainability and resilience plan required by the state of Connecticut, the one promised to Norwalk taxpayers last fall before the vote to adopt new zoning regulations. Not sure why my comments about drainage, flooding, pollution, permitting, enforcement, and public education were off topic. However, Chairman Lopez following interrupting me allowed me to speak. Nothing was cut short. And I thank Chairman Lopez for allowing me to finish my comments. Your minutes also include Chairman Lopez thanking Mr. Slobin and asking him about specific and binding constraints found in the area of administrative and operational capacity. Mr. Slobin's answer <clears throat> was one, enforcement or lack thereof, my long outstanding complaint is an example, and two, staff having the time, capacity, and knowledge to review and understand resilience and sustainability implications. If staff had the time, capacity, or knowledge to understand resilience and sustainability implications, p and commissioners would never have approved new zoning regulations to increase density in the coastal flood zone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Jones. Katie, do you have anyone else that would like to speak? No one else is hands All right, so that closes no. public participation. Next item is the approval of the minutes from March 13th, regular meeting to have a motion. Thank you, Ms. Shanahan. Any corrections, deletions, or omissions? Nope, going once, going twice. Okay, nope. All right, so all in favor of the minutes? Okay, it is warm. Thank you very much. Okay, so next item the agenda, on the agenda is our microforce presentation by Miss Mary Ellen LeMay. Is that, did I say that right? Uh, yes, that's right. Okay, all right, thank you so much. So I'll turn it over to you, uh, Miss LeMay. Okay, great. Um, so I will share my screen and get started here. Um, Hopefully you can, can you see my screen okay? We can see it. I think there's, I, think, okay. I don't know. Would you prefer a lot of it? stuff on here. <laughs> yeah, no, we can definitely see it. Um, can everyone else see it? Should we make it a little bit bigger or put it into like yeah, a let me, uh, presentation? Um, let me get it to a presentation. Yeah. Side. There we go. Okay, that's, is that better? Yeah, that works. Thank you. Okay, great. Very good. Well, thank you everyone for, um, inviting me to to speak to you this evening. Um, I was asked by um, Lisa Shanahan to share some information um, of projects that we're working on with the Aspetuck Land Trust um, in the city of Bridgeport. Um, and I know the city of Norwalk is now looking at um, uh, going for a grant to also begin installing some of these Miyawaki forests, uh, at least one to start with uh, in Norwalk. So. Um, I wanted to kind of share some information with you about uh, our experiences and what a Miyawaki forest is. So um, this is 
a kind of a new presentation I put together this evening for you. So um, uh, there's a lot of pictures and I think it should be kind of fun. Um, so I'm the director of landowner engagement um, at the Aspetuck Land Trust, which is um, a multi-town uh, land trust now. We are Fairfield, uh, West, Westport, Weston, um, uh, and Easton, and now we have Monroe and Bridgeport and potentially soon to be Shelton. So um, uh, it's been very exciting in the five years I've been with the land trust that um, uh, we're hopefully turning into a more regional land trust. And that allows for us to um, go out for projects like this, um, especially in our urban center, which is the city of Bridgeport. So um, I'm just going to start right in um, and start with the presentation. Uh, so the question is, what is a Miyawaki forest? Um, it is actually a, a supercharged tiny forest. It's um, it's a forestry method of what, what you can generally term as micro forests, but it's the Miyawaki method, which was started over 50 years ago um, in Japan by Akira Miyawaki, who is a botanist uh, who just passed away recently, I think like two or three years ago. Um, and so it is a method of densely planting native tree seedlings um, in naturally amended soil to quickly restore the native tree canopy in urban areas. So um, living in a city, you know that if there's areas that are um, left vacant, um, you begin to see plants start coming back. Usually it's invasives. Uh, and then over time, there's a natural progression of the tree canopy, but it could take 50, 100 years or longer. Uh, the Miyawaki forest method supercharges that natural um, selection process. Um, and so it's really a very innovative um, uh, method that really hasn't been used in the United States that uh, recently, um, uh, until recently. So, it's, but today there are thousands of these micro forests or Miyawaki forests all over the world. Um, to heal urban landscapes, to heal industrial, old industrial landscapes. And really in the face of climate change, we don't have a lot of time to wait 50 or 100 years for a mature forest to come back. Um, and that's why I think that this method of using these Miyawaki forests and getting them into the ground in as many places as we can in the cities um, will help to restore the tree canopy at a much faster rate than we could if we just put street trees in. Um, so there's uh, uh, Dr. Miyawaki. Um, this is his very first Miyawaki forest. It was planted um, at the Nippon Steel Company. Um, and it is now half a century old. It is now a self-sustained biotope. And he was hired um, by the Nippon Steel uh, Company to replant some of the barren industrial areas around their um, their plant. And he, he, as a botanist, thought that he would try this method of really densely planting native trees. And his goal was to get the forest to, to a point where it is self-sustaining after three years. And it's an interesting story because um, the reason he came up with this three-year artificial deadline was because at um, at Nippon Steel, the executives typically and management and executives stay in their positions for about three years, and then they move up. And so he wanted to give this team that was working with him a deliverable at the end of three years. And so he said to them, I can get you a forest that is starting to grow and will be um, maintenance free after three years. So uh, that's where we, the three years came from. And it is, you know, from, from country to country, um, we are seeing that these forests grow so rapidly that really in, after three years, they become maintenance free because they're kind of relying on each other. It's a really neat method. Um, so after he did that first, um, after he did that first project, um, 
Toyota and a lot of other um, industries in Japan started hiring him. Um, and this is the Tokyo Electric Power Company and started in 1980. Uh, he started this long stretch of forest. Like these are pretty massive areas that were in post-industrial areas. Um, and he started planting uh, one plant per square meter. And then later as the planting went on, as you can imagine something this size would have taken a couple of years to plant, um, planting increased to three plants. And that is roughly three plants per meter per square meter. And that's still roughly the formula that we're using today. And this picture on the right was taken um, 10 years later. And then the trees still have yet to reach full uh, maturity and they have formed a dense forest. So. This forest now is functioning, capturing the particulate matter from the factories, uh, capturing carbon from the air, managing stormwater, and creating these little pockets of biodiversity in the landscape. Um, so this is kind of like really a supercharged um, method of forestry. So Dr. Miyawaki um, continued with, um, trying in, in other places and Yokohama University in 1979. This one um, I found very interesting because it's on a slope, a very, very steep slope. And so he created what um, are, are terrace, you know, terraced areas and then planted the forest in a terrace. And so you see 1999, 20 years later, it's an absolute wall of uh, forest. And um, these trees that were selected, they are or native trees to Japan, multiple species that function together um, and work in a way that um, supports each other. I mean, typically in forestry, we always had a goal of getting the forest to grow in such a way that we could harvest the trees for wood. Um, and so natural selection would mean we would want just the oaks or just the maple to grow. Uh, and everything else was just, you know, garbage trees. In this in the Miyawaki um, method, you are planting together trees that go together with shrubs that they should be with just in that layered landscape that you see in nature, um, except we're mixing them together uh, into a small dense landscape. Getting the soil naturally amended helps to give it like a B12 shot. So down below that picture is in India. So you can see this was after one year. Uh, of course, the climate there is very different. The species are very different, but you can see the little man down here. Uh, the trees are over his head in one year. So um, every place these are planted, they are using native trees uh, and native soil amendments to that area. Um, and so they're gonna kind of grow at somewhat different rates, but um, I can share with you the one that, that we were using as our model um, and it grows just as fast as these. Um, so the basic method is to plant seedlings, uh, tree and shrub seedlings densely, randomly, and mix as many native trees um, with vegetation as possible. The density again should be three to four seedlings per square meter. These are very fairly small. I'll show you when we did it, we um, used larger um, trees. They were still in one gallon pots, but we didn't go with seedlings. Using seedlings is always a good idea as Doug Tallamy tells us, using the smaller the tree, the faster it adapts in the soil and it will take off and plus you'll save a lot of money. So. Um, uh, ordering trees, for example, from uh, New England wetland plants, um, where they did for the first Miyawaki in Massachusetts, um, they were smaller, um, but they took off just as fast as if you planted bigger ones. With approximately three years after plant planting, the seedlings will grow under severe competition, which leads to natural selection among the seedlings. Um, but you don't have to be aware of the natural selection like you would if you were growing forests for wood um, because you want to grow the forest. You're not just growing the trees, you're growing the forest. Um, and after I did this talk in at the CLCC meeting a week or so ago, somebody asked me afterwards that, you know, it's not really natural selection because you are stacking the deck in favor of certain species. 
And I said, that's exactly what we're doing. We are stacking the deck so that we have the right trees in the right place planted in a space in spacing that has been tested for over 50 years since Dr. Miyawaki started this. So we're not reinventing the wheel here uh, in terms of getting this to work. It, we know that it works. It's just a very novel way of planting very fast growing forests. And on, on the right, you'll see by 15 to 20 years afterwards, you will have the early model of a dense somewhat mature forest that would have taken um, 50 years to get to that point. Um, and by 25, 30 years, you'll have what could be almost like a, a, a hundred year forest. You, the trees that we see now in our landscape, those are 100, 150 year old um, trees for the most part. So, you know, it's not just filling up the land with these little forests. The, Features and the benefits of these Miyawaki forests far out exceed tra traditional goals for forestry because we're not growing to harvest the trees as a, as a crop. We're growing these to help to us to manage the changes of, we're seeing in climate change. Um, so of course, Dr. Miyawaki started this in 1972. They weren't talking about climate change then. His focus was really on Re, uh, recovering these industrial sites. But as these have been planted over the past 50, 50 years, they've been measured and you've, they've seen and measured that carbon sequestration is much, um, it is much larger with these Miyawaki forests than in a traditional forest. Heat reduction, because they get sh shady very fast. Pollution reduction, gathering particulate matter um, has been measured over the years to be a greater um, benefit than the traditional forest, certainly more than street trees. Um, and the soil biology and the water il infiltration, managing our stormwater issues on our and our all through Connecticut, um, not only just our coastal properties, but managing stormwater is a big um, benefit to the Miyawaki forests and then biodiversity. Um, this as a land trust, um, you know, this was our major uh, interest was improving biodiversity by creating connectivity along the land in the landscape. But um, this is a great benefit, no matter how small you make these Miyawaki forests, the ones we're doing at the schools, the students are going to see um, biodiversity in increasing and the fun is that they're going to be able to measure it um, over time and see the insects that are showing up and the birds that are showing up just in these little forest patches. So this is an aerial shot of um, the first Miyawaki forest in the Northeast. Um, this is in Danahee Park in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, this is the first time I had ever seen this uh, forest. It was in the Ecological Landscape Alliance um, December newsletter. And I saw this picture and I thought, what the heck is that? I had never seen anything like this before. Um, so I read the article and then I began to research a bit more about um, these forests. And I was fascinated by this. This, this one was put in a park. Um, and it is about 4,000 square feet. You can see the little people there. Um, and I thought, wow, this is really a, an amazing opportunity to try something totally different. And um, I, I got a master's in environmental management from the Yale School of Forestry. And we never talked about this, um, wasn't really discussed. Maybe if I, uh, if I had an in-depth uh, degree in forestry, this probably may have come up. But in general, for urban restoration, um, this really wasn't talked about. And so I'm excited that this has started. Um, and, and I'm thankful to the folks in uh, Cambridge for being the daring ones to do the first one in the Northeast. So this is the Cambridge forest over time. Uh, 2021, they planted it. 2022, it's filled in really nicely. Um, and 2023, uh, this was from the New York Times article. Um, and you can't really see how big it is, but um, the next couple of slides are the ones I took because I went up in um, August of 2023 to visit it. And um, I really couldn't 
believe my eyes. Uh, so it, once I saw that, I thought we have to begin to do this in our urban areas um, in Connecticut. So again, they grow 10 times faster than a traditional forest. This is 20 times more biodiversity. It's 18 to 20. It could be even more depending on the location that you're in. 30 times denser. So really breaking the rules here by planting them super close. Um, and then local, you know, this is a way to do um, really amazing action steps at a local level and get people engaged. And it's totally participative and it's for getting schools and um, the community all together and to watch these grow over time. So um, this again is, is Danahy Park. This uh, July 24th, 2022, these pictures were taken by our um, our friend Will Roland at Connecticut Gardener Magazine. He went up uh, and saw it uh, just at 10 months. Now you see the rest of this park, uh, this is brown. It was uh, during a drought. That summer was really hot and didn't get a lot of rain. They had to um, irrigate this forest. So uh, in year one, of course, it needs water and weeding, um, but you can see that it it is uh, growing nicely and it's not even reached its first year yet. Um, there's a group called the Suji Forest Project that um, manages uh, the, the construction, the design and build of Miwaki forests all over the world. And what they typically do is a really cool illustration of one of the forests that, that they're gonna do. So you can see this is Danahy Park, here's that building and here's that building. Um, so when we started our projects, we didn't reach out to Suji because um, I used the folks in um, at, at Danahy Park in Cambridge as my, uh, my tutors. Um, so we didn't do Suji. Now, recently you may have seen that New York City is doing their first Milwaukee forest um, and they had an illustration by Suji. So they have reached out to Suji to help them with their forest. This is a 4,000 square foot um, uh, micro forest. It doesn't look like that from the photo, but um, when you're there, you can see how big it is. Um, over 1,352 plants that were all put in as small seedlings. They were from New England wetland plants. Um, and this was August 2023 uh, when I went with some folks from Aspetuck Land Trust. I went with Lou Bakioki, who's our steward and um, who's right here and our summer intern, um, Owen, who just happens to be about six foot seven. So I took a picture of Owen standing next to this forest, which is not yet two years old. Um, and it is, a, the bigger canopy trees are over um, his head. So this is just before the two year birthday of the Miyawaki forest. And you can see how much I'll, I'll go back to the other picture so you can see what it looked like at year one and then year two. You can see how tall these are. Um, this is Maya Dutta, who uh, was the person who spearheaded this whole project. Um, I had Maya do a lunch and learn for me um, a couple of months ago. Um, she works for the Biodiversity for a Livable Climate and has just been accepted into Yale School of Forestry. So she's gonna start there this fall. And I'm just delighted to have her closer to us. Um, she would be a great person to help walk the landscape with us as we begin to scope out areas for new um, Miyawaki forests. So these are pictures that I took inside the Cambridge Miyawaki forest. This is, um, I think these are eight or nine pictures of different species. Um, as I said, there were 42 species, a variety of 42 species that were planted in that forest. Um, and I just took some zoom in shots of uh, some of them that were there. Um, the ground cell tree, which you don't often see, it is a coastal, um, tree uh, or it's a shrub it almost looks like um bayberry but it blooms for pollinators we have a lot of ground cell at one of at our southport preserve it likes to be uh, in coastal areas so it really is a perfect 
plant for, um, you know, hardcore uh, industrial sites. The shining sumac there was really, really pretty. Um, and this was August. So these things were getting ready to begin to make their berries. Uh, big tooth aspen and quaking aspen um, were really took off. Uh, and gray alder, which is tends to like its kind of wet feet, uh, witch hazel, button bush, sweet gale. Um, there was incredible elderberry in there. And it was just loaded with um, birds, this whole forest. It was so dense. Um, and I, I didn't even have a picture of how dark it was in there, but you stick your head into this round circle of a forest and it was dark and dense. So there were no weeds growing up uh, in this uh, forest. So after seeing Cambridge, um, uh, Lou and I thought, wow, we let this would be a great project for a land trust. First of all, if we have areas in our forest that we're removing a lot of invasives, this would be perfect to really densely plant um, uh, these forests and uh, with shrubs and trees and just kind of supercharge the area before the invasives come back. But we said, you know, in the city itself, um, I think as a land trust, we can have a local sustainable impact by not only bringing our, student, our students to our forests, our land trust properties, hiking our trails, but also bring our forests to the students. And the Milwaukee design helps us to do that. So we applied for a grant for the, Conne uh, the Connecticut Department of Agriculture Climate Smart Grant. Um, they had, so of course, Department of Ag, you think is mostly farm-based projects, but it was far farm and forestry. So um, I thought that this is an, a forestry method. Maybe this will be accepted as a grant. And needless to say, it was. Uh, we got everything that we asked for and the Department of Ag um, was really excited about this project because they had not heard about the Milwaukee Forest. So um, we got the grant and we chose seven elementary schools in the city of Bridgeport. Um, we have a total so far of over 2,250 uh, square feet of forest that um, is added. Total of, uh, you know, four and a half thousand native trees, shrubs and plants. And the fun part about this as well is this is a student scientist program. So not only are we planting these, we are measuring the benefits of these trees over time. This was a climate smart grant. So as much as we were interested in improving biodiversity, the Department of Ag um, wanted us to measure uh, climate impact. So it was perfect for us to look at things like stormwater, um, air quality, air temperature, particulate matter. And a lot of those things can be measured using the iTree app. So it's an app that um, I'll show you in another slide where I went in and taught the kids, um, fourth graders uh, on their Chromebooks were pulling up iTree and we were working on it together. It is that user-friendly. Um, and the exciting thing is these are fourth graders that we planted this forest with. Um, in Bridgeport Public Schools, they stay there through eighth grade. So in four years, these trees are gonna be over the students' heads and they're gonna be able to follow each species as it grows and measure over time how much stormwater is captured as the tree gets bigger, how much carbon is sequestered as the tree gets bigger. And then we're gonna multiply it out by the forest and see a big impact um, for this Climate Smart Grant. So um, this partnership has been really fun. We hired uh, Planet Wild. Um, they were one of the, the few landscape design companies that I thought would be able to do this with us because um, David um, Baker and Bram Gunther both came from New York City um, parks. Uh, Bram was the head of forestry in New York City for 25 years or more. So they understand urban trees. They understand what it takes to get trees to grow in a city. And they were excited to, for the first time, try a Milwaukee forest. So um, they're a great team to work with. Um, and they've been wonderful with the kids too. Uh, they're really great at teaching the kids. So, 
Um, our folks at Planet Wild, they did the talk with me a couple of weeks ago. So those are a couple of their slides. Um, when they helped us choose the plants, it was important to look at species that were, oops, I'm running over my time, uh, that were resilient in the urban setting, were available, and were ecologically compatible. Um, uh, I guess that P is in the wrong place, uh, or ecologic potential. They had a really good impact, will have really good impact on biodiversity. And they had to really look good too. Um, so the formula for our Milwaukee forest was small, 100 square feet, not 4,000 square feet. Um, we came up with this, um, it was kind of a building block of 100 square feet. Some schools could take three building blocks and do 300 square feet. Some could do 600 square feet, but we use this as our basic tool, 150 plants in 100 square feet typically two canopy trees, 16 understory trees, 32 shrubs. And when I say shrubs, I mean like, um, uh, oh gosh, there are bayberries in there, but smaller trees like elderberry, um, which was a major one. We they ordered a bunch of elderberry because they were so beautiful. We're talking big shrubs and then ground covers. Um, and this is the full list of what we planted um, this was last year's. We did three of the seven last year. We've got four forests to go, four schools to go. Um, but this is what's in here. These are these are chosen for um, impact on biodiversity. These are, of course, the ones that um, you know you get flowers and fruit, and you get fall color. Um, they were chosen for caterpillar. Um, uh, you know, populations, they were chosen for pollinator. Um, so these are all of the fabulous natives that we want to have in our, in our landscape. Um, and so this is what went into, in a very dense way, into our hundred square foot forest, believe it or not. Um, this was a 600 square foot plan. This is uh, 100, like 100 square feet, 200, 300, 400. 400, 500, 600. So this is six of those building blocks. Um, and this was called the embrace because it's the entrance to this school and it kind of curves along here. Um, this is an aerial shot. We have uh, one of our employees has a, um, a drone. So on the day of planting, he went up really high and got really cool pictures. Um, and so this shows you the design of this. Again, it's 600 square feet, not 4,000 square feet. And it's big. Um, and so we had two classes of fourth graders coming out, come out, um, and, and a lot of the administrators and principals came out and it was a lot of fun. Um, the kids were taught to put these plants in, um, and it was all, you know, was prepared by the folks at Planet Wild. Um, all of the trees and shrubs were purchased through Long Island Natives. Long Island Natives is who I use for my native plant sale. Um, and they had uh, almost all of the trees that, except for um, a hazelnut, uh, they had all of the trees that we needed. So um, ours didn't come from New England wetland plants. See, these are a little bit bigger. They're one and two gallon um, trees from Long Island natives. This is one that we're gonna plant this year. Uh, it's just literally a circle. So it's the perfect, place for a Milwaukee forest. This is called the, the forest um, pod. Uh, and right now it's just in the middle of an asphalt area in uh, a shared space between the Tisdale School and a Bridgeport Park. So this is a kind of a shared space. Trust for Public Land had done some really some native tree plantings in here, but we thought right in the center would be, make a beautiful Milwaukee forest. So we're going to do this one this year. This is the artist rendering. As you see, there's all different levels. There's ground covers down here. There's small canopy trees, um, red buds, dogwood, and then um, some of the larger. Here's our two big um, canopy trees there. So as this matures, it's going to be a multi-level area. What we did differently from Cambridge was we decided that we needed to get these kids into the center of the forest so that they could experience the shade and hear the birds. Um, so we we plant uh, we plant to put um, 
uh, pathways through. So this is our aerial shot of the one we're gonna do at Tisdale. And um, I based it off of one that was done in Washington last year. Um, and this is um, at a school that is predominantly um, uh, indigenous people, Native Americans um, out in Washington. And I just loved the way this circle was uh, cut into four north, south, east, west. Um, this is called a Native medicine circle. Um, so we use this design for ours, and I'm gonna have um, Lou, who works with us, uh, cut some uh, tuffets, I call them, wooden little tuffets that are gonna go in, a little seating area in the middle so the students can go inside and be quiet and feel the cool and hear the birds and hear the quiet um, of being inside a forest. And this was one of the best pictures I could find of really how truly dark it gets inside these Miyawaki forests, no matter how small they are. Um, so this has just been a great project for us. The kids have been fabulous. These are fourth graders at one of the schools. They loved getting out um, and digging with us. Um, and it's really about the trees and the kids and their future together from planting in the schoolyard. And then I go back into the classroom with them, teach them how to use eye tree. They each picked their own species. Um, one girl uh, this picked a sassafras because she remembered that she planted a sassafras outside in the forest. So she's going to follow the sassafras as it gets bigger. Um, one of the students did a profile um, on oak because, of course, Doug Tallamy is oaks. So we always have to plant those. And then fourth grade is about the time that the kids start learning about photosynthesis. So this was a perfect age for us to um, get these kids involved. Um, and so here's our goal that the, the forests will grow along with the kids. Uh, this, this was five years, this was in uh, Amsterdam, but um, 2018, the kids were out there planting and in five years, it's over their heads. And what a perfect thing for them to see year after year as they come back to school. And then maybe they'll bring their children back someday and there'll be a mature forest there. So, um, so this is this is sort of the six the uh, seven sites that we chose um, where there are forests in Bridgeport, um, and, and then some pictures of uh, the planting. So um, seven elementary schools, uh, forty six ninety five native trees, twenty two fifty square feet of forest, um, and we like you guys are applying for this urban forestry grant to see if we can put a big one in, which will be about four thousand square feet and one of our coastal, um, City of Bridgeport coastal properties, and we're gonna call it Miyawaki by the Sea. So we're hoping that you guys get your forest grant and we get our forest grant and we can get more Miyawaki forests into Connecticut um, because it's just such a great project and especially for land trusts and people, um, Norwalk River Watershed Association and other sustainability groups to get together and do this. Um, I think it's, it really is a new uh, opportunity to engage the public in something that ha will have an impact. This tiny forest will have a big impact on increasing the tree canopy and ma managing in the face of climate change. So that's all I had. I'm sorry, I did go a little bit old over, but that was the first time I did it. So I was only 10 minutes over, sorry. <laughs> Mary Ellen, thank you so much. No, it's, it's totally fine. Thank you so much. That was very insightful. It's just it's, it's, some of those pictures of schematics are, are beautiful. And uh, just looking at the what the benefits are, especially like in the urban core, it's just it's really um, it, it's promising. It, it's, it's really exciting. But so I'll just start off with 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 a couple of questions. And we'll move on to other people. Um, quick question is like, have you noticed any any specific effective strategies when you're dealing with the community in order to educate them or educate the public? about the importance of uh, and the benefits of, of a microforest? Well, we, um, we were lucky. We actually had one person who had a very strong connection in the elementary schools in um, Bridgeport. So that's why we chose to take that route to just go right into the schools, but instead of going directly to the city of Bridgeport. So um, we kind of, just we had the idea and just had this person, we had done a couple of pollinator gardens in multiple schools. And this gentleman, um, 
he he was a teacher. Um, he's retired now, but he um, goes from school to school working with the TAG students, the talented and gifted kids. Um, and so there were groups of students that were really engaged in, in the pollinator gardens. So that was our first step. Um, and then when we brought this concept of the Miyawaki forest, um, to them, they, we went right to the principals. So it went to the principals and then to the superintendent of schools. So that gave us the attention uh, in the city. And then the city said, hey, we want to do these on city property. So they came to us then and said, let's look at some other sites. So we went the route of the schools first. Um, and we used the um, teams that were there on the ground in the schools the right teachers, the right uh, principals. Um, and they kind of curated the group of, of kids that were gonna work with us, um, which was awesome. Because I mean, there's 45 public schools in, in Bridgeport. We would never have known where to go um, if we didn't have this right person. So, um, so that was key. And so we engaged the kids now, I think um, for the next step, uh, we're gonna go to the Boys and Girls Club which is separate from the schools uh, and begin working with them. Um, but our teams in Bridgeport, like uh, Trust for Public Land and Groundwork Bridgeport, um, they are great sustainability teams that are already in place. So we just partner with them um, and they have bigger grants and bigger projects. So we hope we can kind of insert our little forests into their project into their projects, but we're just getting them started at the schools first. Gotcha, thank you so much, thank okay. you. Um, does anyone else have any questions for Mary Ellen? I do. Oh, good, yes, Councilman. <laughs> I've got so many questions for <laughs> Mary Ellen. Some of them I'll take offline, but um, so how, so your 100 square foot, do you think that that's like the minimal space that one would could you know put one of these little forests or you need 100 square feet, is that? I mean, how small can you go? You yeah, that well, that's you know, that's the key, Lisa. We our goal was to find, you know, what's this? What's the smallest we can go? Um, and you know, because schools don't have a lot of properties, and 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 so if we can just drop a hundred square, so we do have, um, um, we're going to have four schools that will only have a, about a hundred square feet. Actually, we found um, we this is the first time we were doing it so we could see how much money we were saving we were going to fence them in the first one the first two we fenced in um temporary fencing uh that would come down after two years but we decided most of these schoolyards are fenced in anyway so we took out the fencing which saved some money and this year we're making the the minimum size is 225 square feet so the folks at planet wild said let's just make them a little bigger um but 100 is the smallest we use that as kind of the building block um but really would love to like cambridge is, is four thousand. they said to us a thousand is the minimum but nobody knows so yeah. we're just testing where we have space and you know 100 square feet a 10 by 10 of concentrated forest is better than a 10 by 10 of lawn or dirt <laughs> Sure. So, yeah. um, and when you think about it, 10 by 10 is so doable in so many different places. And yeah, things. right. And that's why we, you know, we engage Planet Wild too. That's the other reason because they're working on this um, uh, measurement tool called Proof of Life. So we're going to continue to work with them for years to come and see, wow, is there life here? What, you know, we they're doing baselines at all the schools. So we know what species are there now in terms of insects and birds. And, and then We'd like to see in a year, two years, three years, four years, what shows up and could very well be that hundred square feet is, is just fine. Thousands better, but we put in whatever you can do. Exactly. That was one of the things that I thought was great about Planet Wild when we met with them because um, of them doing all the metric work and being able to have that those metrics for purposes of going and adding more forests as you go along. So it's so great to be part of the experiment, I think. Yes up and down the coast. And, you know, for 10 by 10, you know, the hundred square foot, is there a sense of like what it costs per, I mean, did you look at that to see, you know, what's a hundred square feet cost you? Yeah, we, we kind of, um, we're still looking at that because there are so many factors um, involved in terms of, you know, what we can get away with doing and what not. So 
um, soil preparation, we're just going with, you know, local good compost, really getting that in there, um, uh, which was not a big cost, but we noticed the folks in, in uh, Cambridge when they, in subsequent forests, they started doing something which I think is really cool called um, uh, compost tea dipping. They actually have a video on their website. So they take the pots, the, the trees out of the pot, and then they dip the, the, the pot into the tree, into compost tea, and so let it soak for a while, which is really cool because that's how I would love to do it, and then put it into um, the garden. So it's like giving it a shot of B12. Um, I'm now going to just, we're not going to do it in this, this grant, but we might in the future. So I have to get some pricing on compost tea if we were to do that. We didn't want to mess up this experiment and add another factor in that we could. <laughs> like, wow, those trees grew a lot bigger than these. But that was an added cost. Um, the fencing was factored in to the per, you know, per square, 100 square foot cost, but we didn't need that. So yeah. we took that out. Um, and but, so the thing you would say would be really deer dependent, right? Like whether or not you're in an area where you have to worry about herds of deer coming in to graze. Right. So, you know, it's hard to see, this is kind of what we're working on with the, the planet wild folks. I mean, we, in our, in our first contract, we had about 8,000, roughly 8,000, 8,000 dollars a hundred square foot. Um, but that included all of the planting, the maintenance, the, for the teams that included the monitoring and the overtime research. So that price included a lot more things than if I was going to do one in my backyard. Um, so the trees you can get, the, you know, at wholesale price, um, I, I think that it, I think it's a pretty affordable way to go if, you know, the more you do these and you find really good suppliers and you get volunteers to put them in and then you teach oh, the kids to do the IT, the eye tree over time. Um, they might not be a, a part of this research initiative. Um, but when we had a grant, we could help to kind of accelerate the research that needs to be done in these backyard hundred foot. So, so the pricing is, is kind of still being worked out and um, we're just trying to find the best price um, and the best size. So, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll have those numbers, you know, probably this, this year, I would tend to think. So the, the number of trees alone, just buying the trees for the seven gardens that we did, just the trees, was about ten thousand um, oh, dollars. That's pretty cool for four thousand. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so the folks in um, in uh, Cambridge, four thousand square foot. Theirs was about fourteen thousand dollars, something like that. So they got really small, really small seedlings. So that's just you know, just the the trees. That wasn't including the um, mulch or the your soil or the rental, the tiller, the watering, the labor, all that stuff. So whatever you can do with volunteers will save you money. <laughs> well, we, we, it's great to have the public engagement and have people who live by the forest be really invested by helping plant. Yes, yeah, absolutely. It, it's actually interesting just like when, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I volunteered a long time ago, uh, I, worked, I, I worked alongside members of the Peace Corps in Nicaragua. And so one of the single development projects that we were working on involved the actual community themselves. We would provide them with the trees, the different types of fruit trees, but we would also teach them how to plant and how to take care of them. And they, I mean, it was just, it was, there was a tremendous uh, amount of support from the communities. I mean, so yeah, it just reminded me of that story from a long time ago. But, I love uh, it, yeah. yeah. And they, it's like a sense of, they have a sense of ownership because they were there when those right, trees, exactly. you know, Absolutely. went in yeah. and- that's what I'm finding with the students when I go into the classroom, like they remembered sassafras um, and that's the tree they put in. And a couple of the kids said, hey, can we have a next year at the, can we have a birthday party for the first year that the the forest is in? I was like, absolutely, we can have a birthday party that. at the forest, you know, because they really want to watch it over time. These kids are just like really engaged in this um get getting dirty and getting their hands dirty and and watching the plants oh and they'll protect them too that's why we didn't continue with the fences 
because these teams of kids were like, hey, those are my trees. Don't cut my trees. And they won. We haven't had really, I mean, we just planted them in the fall, but everything looks really uh, like it survived the winter pretty nicely. So awesome. Yeah. I can't wait to come visit. <laughs> yeah, I know. These are so much fun to put in. I, I, we've got a couple. We're going to try and put them in. This is spring. We're going to do early. So April, May, uh, April, May, um, get the other four in and then the maintenance will begin over and the monitoring over the next two years. So that was part of our contract with Planet Wild. And that's what the Department of Ag wanted. They wanted this research. They wanted the evaluation and the monitoring over time. Um, so that's, you know, that's why the the funding was so important um, from them to be able to do this monitoring and and with um, the the um, the tool that they're developing Desiree Narango who is Doug Talamy's she was his right hand woman um, she was the one that did the chickadee research um, so she works at the Vermont um, Center for Ecosystem Studies. She has been hired by Planet Wild to develop the proof of life tool. So we get people who, you know, and Doug Tallamy is on the advisory board. So it's a good opportunity for us to have like really good people who are overseeing this um, and measuring the impact of what we do in our backyards, no matter how small, can have a big impact. Excellent, Mary Ellen. Thank you so much. This was very informative. I'm sure we'll be in touch, but this is this okay. is very cool. Thank you so My much. My pleasure. I'll share the slides um, with Lisa so she can have them. Um, Thanks. You can go on on the road and do your own presentation. Thank you for inviting me. It was so good. Thank to you, see you so much, Mary Ellen. Thank you so much for Talk joining you us. Soon. Thank All you. Right. Thanks. Okay. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Um, I think okay. Um, hey Brian, did you want to? Is Brian still on? Did you want to uh, provide any comments? Anything before we adjourn? If he's there, he might not be there. Meeting, I think. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, there we go. Oh, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> so I was just coming off mute. Uh, no, it was a good presentation. No, I just wanted to, you're talking about the sustainable resilience plan for next meeting, Johan. Is that what you want to Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. If you have any, uh, just, just to give everyone like a quick like, update where we are, or, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, yeah, since we had our last presentation, we've been working on defining next steps so that, you know, develop momentum with the plan and keep things moving. Um, working with the city to figure out how best to approach sort of a prioritization strategy. I think we'll work with you all and, and bring something to the table in between the meetings here. We'll, we'll send that an email um, with sort of defining what that looks like. But I think the next step is really taking a look at the sustainable stability and resilience plan and trying to figure out what the priority should be for the next one, three, and five years. You know, we have a, a very large universe of options and different paths we could take. But I think the more refined we can get and targeted, I think the more effective it'll be in the long run. So I think that'll be the next meeting. Um, we'll have a, a, a much more in detail discussion about that. Excellent. Yeah, thank you so much. Perfect. Um, I see, Heather, you are off mute. Did you want to ask something? No, no, no. I just, okay. I have, have Okay, a, yeah, we have the other meeting coming up. Yes. Right um, now, so. Fantastic. So thank you so much, Brian. Uh, thank you, Katie. Thank everyone else. And so I guess, can I have a motion to adjourn? Well, there we go. Thank you, Lisa. All in favor? Okay, thank you. All right. So thanks so much, guys. Talk to you soon. All right, take care, All right, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Ron. Bye.